A San Antonio man spent Christmas in jail. Our cameras were there when he was first picked up by police. That's straight ahead. The days between Christmas and New Year's see the highest spike in drunk driving incidents coming up. One victim's plea with the people to drink responsibly all year round. Warm and humid today, but some chances of rain tomorrow as a cold front moves in. We've got the latest on the timing coming up. Live from KSA 12, the news at noon starts right now. And we begin this noon with an investigation at the Bear County Jail after authorities confirmed to us that an inmate died in his cell overnight. It happened just before 11 last night. During a routine check, a deputy found 61-year-old Stephen Wayne Cole unresponsive. Deputies and medical staff tried helping him, but he was pronounced dead about 30 minutes later. The medical examiner will have the final say on how exactly he died, but BCSO tells us Cole had a medical condition and used drugs. Cole was arrested just this past Sunday. Officials are looking into his death. New details this noon on the death of a pregnant mother on Christmas Day. San Antonio police have charged the father of her children with capital murder. Her name was Gabriela Rodriguez. Police say he shot and killed her and her unborn child while dropping off her two children. He then turned the gun on himself. He's currently at University Hospital with life-threatening injuries. We are still waiting to confirm his name. So far, no word on whether more charges are possible. A family gathering ends with a police sergeant getting hit in the head. It was a Christmas morning that took a turn for the worst. And today we now know the man who was taken into custody and he could be facing multiple charges. KSAT 12's Max Massey was on the scene of the arrest and spoke with police. This is 46 year old Abel Rivera. A young lady here said her boyfriend had molested her 19 year old daughter and she wanted the police here. This is the reason police responded here to the 2100 block of Harper's Ferry on the west side on Christmas morning. But the situation only escalated once police arrived. We go back to the kitchen, try and talk to him. Uh, he had already cut the left side of his uh, neck okay. when we came in there. And we saw the knife on the counter, so we grabbed the knife, put it away from him so he couldn't get it again. On the scene of the arrest, police told me that they tried to talk Rivera down, but he was too intoxicated. So eventually they just had to go in and try to apprehend him. In the process, our sergeant got hit in the face. Uh, his, left, his left ear is cut right now from being hit. And then we we're able to put handcuffs on him and restrain him. Officers on the scene telling me that alcohol played a big factor and they have advice for any more celebrations this holiday season. I would say just stay calm and uh, watch your alcohol intake because that seems to be the majority of the problem. As for Rivera, he has been formally charged with assault of a peace officer causing bodily injury, a second degree felony. Records show he was also arrested on a charge of sexual assault contact, but that charge does not appear on his formal booking record. It is possible that charge could be filed against him at large with the Bear County District Attorney's Office. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Well, taking a look at some overnight headlines, a man who ran off from a traffic stop is still on the run. A BCSO sergeant says they tried pulling a driver over last night near I-35 in Riddiman around 930, but that driver got out of his vehicle and ran away. Several units tried searching for him, including looking in drainage ditches and using canine units. However, deputies needed to call the search late last night. A tense situation on the city's southeast side. San Antonio police called out to the 4300 block of Roland Avenue. A man went to his neighbors to call for help after he says he woke up to his wife with a knife. She slashed his arms and legs and had to be taken to Bamsey and is doing OK. The wife had locked herself in the apartment overnight. No word on whether police have her in custody yet. San Antonio police are looking into whether a driver was drunk when they crashed into a west side home overnight. It happened on the 1300 block of Argarita Avenue. Police say the driver lost control exiting I-10 and crashed into the living room of the home. No one was home at the time. Authorities estimate about $30,000 worth of damage. The holidays often bring celebration, but if you're not careful, lives can be put in danger. More than 2,000 people in Bear County alone were impacted by suspected drunk drivers last year. Text data shows more than 100 people have been killed in Bear County in the last two years. KSAT's Patty Santos spoke with one new mother who says drunk driver robbed her of, a, of precious memories with her own mother, who was cured, killed nearly 20 years ago in a crash. Um, so my mother died when I was four, so I grew up 
basically my whole life without a mom. That same driver that killed her mom also sent Analicia Sarate to the hospital for a month in the fall of 2000. He was driving with his girlfriend and uh, her two kids and his her daughter um, suffered brain trauma. Sarate, who became a new mother recently, says a selfish decision by a drunk driver robbed her of precious memories. She's missed everything, the birth of my child, um, high school graduation, college graduation, Every important milestone has been without her. According to Text.DUI, DUI, crashes involving alcohol, more than 100 people have been killed in Bear County crashes in the last two years. In 2017, 53 people were killed in 2,021 crashes. Last year, the number of deaths was 52 in a total of 2,051 crashes. The saddest part about these stories is that it's 100% preventable. Natalie Paulus with Mothers Against Drunk Driving says personal accountability to not drink and drive and not get in the vehicle with an intoxicated person could prevent some of these deaths. Bear County has one of the highest incidents in the state of Texas for alcohol impaired crashes. If I can save one person, one family, I've done justice for myself and for my mother and my family. Sarate says her mother's killer served two years of a 10-year prison sentence, but was back in prison after another drunk driving crash. Sometimes people just don't learn. That's why you yourself have to take responsibility. Now, the number of DUI crashes for this year will be available after the new year. Mad says they've seen a trend where the number of DUI crashes involving alcohol goes up every year between Christmas and New Year's. They urge anyone who's going to be on the road to look out for impaired drivers if they are out late at night. And of course, don't drink and drive. Well, new FBI data shows hate crimes are increasing in Texas. The State Department of Justice classifies a hate crime as a criminal offense against a person or property that is motivated by race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, and disability. The data shows those crimes jump from 192 in 2017 to 457 in 2018. It also shows that most of those crimes were racially motivated. The numbers are significantly less in San Antonio, with an increase from four to six during the same year. To learn more about hate crimes in Texas and San Antonio and to see our previous reporting on hate groups in the Alamo City, just go to KSAT.com. A new year means new laws for the state of Texas. Five new laws are going into effect January 1st. One Senate bill, 212, requires college and university employees to report incidents of sexual harassment, sexual assault, dating violence and stalking against a student or colleague to their campus coordinator. Failure to do so results in a misdemeanor charge. Another new law aims to boost Texas flood funding. House Bill 492 creates temporary tax relief for homeowners hit hard by disasters. Texas businesses, listen up, this one's for you. House Bill 4390 requires business owners who own or license computerized data that stores personal information to notify people who may be impacted by online breach. They will have up to 60 days after the breach to report it. You can find more of these bills on our website. Just go to KSAT.com. Hey, the Spurs hung pretty tough with the Mavs for most of the game last night, but still came up a little short. We've got highlights coming up in just a few minutes in sports. And President Trump continues to maintain his attacks on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats as the Senate prepares to take up his impeachment. The latest on the battle on Capitol Hill, that's next. This essay salute holiday greeting is brought to you by Broadway Bank. Hi, I'm Tech Sergeant Espinosa, currently here deployed in Afghanistan. I would like to wish my mom, my dad, my sister Genevieve, my nieces Isabella and Juliet, my family and friends in San Antonio, Texas, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I love y'all and I'll be home soon. It's two days after Christmas and President Trump continues to blast House Speaker Nancy Pelosi for threatening to delay his Senate trial. This happening as a moderate Republican is speaking out, criticizing the Senate Majority Leader for his stating his coordinating with the White House on the Senate trial. Here is ABC's Inez de la Quatera in Washington with the latest. A possible crack in Republican unity when it comes to President Trump's impeachment trial. When I heard that, I was disturbed. 
Moderate Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska on KTUU-TV questioning Senate Leader Mitch McConnell's promise to work in total coordination with the White House. To me, it means that we have to take that step back from being hand in glove with the defense. Murkowski is the first Senate Republican to publicly challenge McConnell's view on how he's planning to handle the president's impeachment trial. In the House, not a single Republican voted in favor of either article of impeachment. The Senate's Republican majority is expected to acquit the president. When Congress returns from recess, all eyes will be on a group of moderate Republican senators, Susan Collins and Mitt Romney, and Democrats, Doug Jones and Joe Manchin. All four senators may feel pressured to to vote against their party establishment. If it means that I am viewed as one who looks openly and critically at every issue in front of me rather than acting as a rubber stamp, I'm totally good with that. President Trump, for his part, still lashing out at House Speaker Nancy Pelosi for delaying handing over articles of impeachment to the Senate until she knows what the terms for the trial will be. If McConnell can't reach a deal with Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer on rules for the president's trial, the Senate would likely take a vote on those rules. If all Senate Democrats were to support calls for witnesses and documents to be part of the trial, five Republican senators would be needed for those measures to pass. Inez de Liquitera, ABC News, Washington. Outside with live cam. Ooh, look at the temperature right there. It's hot out. I just walked Getting outside. There. It's hot. Is it? I mean, it's 70, but it almost feels warmer. Is that right, Justin? Maybe a little humidity out there? Well, yeah, there's some humidity, too. So, yeah, it is warm. It's, it's kind of spring-like out there. The sun has popped out, so we lost some of those morning clouds, and as a result, temperatures are starting to jump up. The aquifer is down a tenth of a foot, and we could use a little bit of rain. There is some of the forecast uh, in the seven-day forecast. And your pollen count, not great news. Mountain cedars in the high category mold is also high. It jumped up today. We're going to talk about rain chances tomorrow and on New Year's Day as well. That's coming up. Sarah went outside, didn't need a coat. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sweating. I know. Uh, the little hike up the yeah. stairs. and yeah. This is weird. This is, I mean, this is weird. People You're are usually like, cold. I'm always cold. <laughs> uh, it's warm. 70 degrees. And you'll say people at home are like, what's going on? Yeah, it, you may have to actually turn on the AC today. Uh, it, especially if these clouds continue to clear out, temperatures may jump up into the mid-70s, uh, considering we're already at 70 degrees. There is going to be a change, though, tomorrow. Cold front comes through brings some changes. Not huge changes, but changes nonetheless. Let's take a look at our next cold front. We're thinking this is going to be noticeable, not strong. And with temperatures, what you'll see is we'll go from the 70s and 60s for highs and lows down to the 60s and 30s by Monday morning. It will get a little chilly just because the air will be drier, but this is not a big blast of cold air by any stretch of the imagination. Let's take a look at the satellite and temperatures. The visible satellite shows we've got some high clouds streaming through, but the low clouds really have burned off here around Bear County and points to the east. So we're seeing plenty of sun, New Braunfels, Seguin, uh, down towards, say, Carn City. But as you get out west, the cloud cover is still there. And uh, it's going to be mostly cloudy out to the west. That's going to keep temperatures down just a little bit. Still in the 60s out there. 67 in Uvalde, 68 right now in Del Rio, 68 in Eagle Pass, mid 60s up there in Austin. But where we're seeing more sun, temperatures have jumped up now to 70 at the airport, 70 at Randolph, 70 in New Braunfels. We may see clouds try to fill back in a little bit. I still think it's a mostly cloudy day, but. Uh, areas to the east certainly are going to see a bit more sun. 69 Port SA, 69 Stenson, 70 in Randolph, southeast Julie winds at 10 miles per hour. This continues to bring in the moisture, so it is also a little sticky out there. Uh, dew points are going to stay right around the 60 degree mark today. There's enough moisture there at low levels, and as this next storm system comes in, that should help to create some rain showers tomorrow. Not great chances of rain, but some chances nonetheless. We are seeing a little bit of activity on the radar. These are really light returns. Probably nothing more than a few sprinkles out to the west around Lakey. Uh, but as we zoom out here, we'll show you the big storm system, which is spinning out over the four corners. A lot of snow, a lot of rain. This is a pretty dynamic system. Brought a lot of rain to California yesterday, and it's finally moving uh, towards Texas, already creating some rain in the Texas panhandle. And as this moves closer tomorrow, it won't move over top of us. It'll move north, but there's enough energy there to get some showers and storms going. And uh, let's take a look at the future cast, and they'll show you that uh, by 6 o'clock, we could see a couple showers out there. Can't rule it out. 
and by tomorrow morning I think we'll see some drizzle, maybe some more fog. And here comes our storm system. Uh, it'll be in the hill country by two o'clock and then by the afternoon here it comes moving through San Antonio. Rain chances right along it. The best chance for rain is going to be to our north, but I think about a 30% shot at some showers and storms and then behind the front some drier air filters in and by Sunday morning we should be clearing out. It'll feel pretty nice on Sunday. Let's take a look ahead to New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Some increasing clouds on New Year's Eve and then a decent chance of rain New Year's Day. I don't think it's going to interrupt our plans to ring in the new year uh, at midnight, but during the day on New Year's Day, uh, the rain looks to move in. So 71 tomorrow, 30% chance of rain, 64 Tuesday or 64 Sunday. Still got my days messed up. 62 Monday and then uh, some cooler temperatures Tuesday and Wednesday as we get more clouds and again, maybe some showers that'll linger over into Thursday as well. So when you say to the north for tomorrow for this front to come through in the rain, are you talking like Austin North or like Hill Country North? Well, no, I, I think North more like Waco, Dallas could oh, have a man. better chance of rain. We, we always tend to it's miss like out on the tail end of stuff. <laughs> Waco, I didn't know. Way up, way up I was thinking like states like out of Texas. Yeah, well, we'll get some rain. Man. Hey, still to come, the Spurs run into another hot shooting team from three-point range. Why does that always happen to them? And the Cowboy season is riding on a sore arm. Coming up. Probably not who the Spurs wanted to see back in uniform for the Mavericks last night. Luka Doncic missed the last four games with an ankle spray. Rookie of the year and current MVP contract with con candidates was back. Right on the night, Seth Curry's behind the back pass to Dungeons for the baseline jam. Dallas up 2015. Spurs make the first quarter run, though. Patty Mills with the steal. He's going to get the layup. That gave the Spurs their first lead, 21-20. Very next possession, Derek White, three. 13-2 run for the Spurs. are up 24-20. Second quarter, DeMar DeRozan drives in for the floater. He led the Spurs with 21, 40-38 Spurs. Lamarcus continued his assault from three-point range. It's 45-42, but the Mavs close out on a 10-2 run. They ended it with this buzzer beater from Krista Parzingis. Oh, that hurt. Mavs up at the half, 52-47. We go to the third quarter. Still a close game. DeMar hits the little pull-up right there at the free throw line. But the Mavs open things up with a 12-2 run. Don't just with a floater in the lane to make it 76-64. Pop not thrilled. Luka with 24 points, 10 rebounds, 8 assists. But not done. They answer with an 8 0 run to close out the quarter. Rudy Gay hit back to back threes. He had 18 off the bench. Spurs within five. They cut that lead down to three on the Patty Mills baseline layup. And the Mavs make their move. That was Porzingis again with a second of back to back threes. That made it 88 79. And then Daly on right with uh, three of his own, 180, 100 to 85. And they put it away. However, Rudy hits a three, and the Spurs actually climb back into it. They got within four with a 13 nothing to run, but then they couldn't close it out, as you see there. And they fall to the Mavs, 102 to 98. All right, so they're back home to take on the Detroit Pistons. That's coming up tomorrow night. Tip off for that one to be at 7.30 at the AT&T Center. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Hey, once again, Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott limited to practice again this week, just like last week before the Eagles game. And you remember, they didn't score a TD in that one, so hope that's not a bad sign. He didn't practice again. He is suffering from that sore AC joint in his throwing shoulder. He got in that win over the Rams. So he has not been allowed to practice with his teammates this week and is not expected to do so again today, the final day of workouts before the game Sunday. Yesterday, he talked about his current status as the Cowboys get ready to take on the Washington Redskins a game. They have to win for any hope of making the playoffs. It's been getting better, so that's that's the positive. Uh, but just all the all the treatment, all the different things that they got uh, that the medical staff have in there for me to do. Uh, but for the most part, contrasting the heat, uh, heat nice and just doing everything I can to make sure that uh, come Sunday it's better. Been able to go through the walkthrough, do that for the most part. Uh, I mean. Uh, really taking steps, everything, but just pushing the ball down the field for the most part. Uh, and that's just kind of part of it. Got to rest it for it to get better, uh, and it will. We'll see how it works Sunday. Meanwhile, the Houston Texans have taken care of their business and have clinched the AFC South, so they will close out their regular season Sunday against the Titans at home before getting ready for the playoffs. Pretty incredible to see J.J. Watt back on the practice field just eight weeks after having that surgery to repair a torn pectoral muscle. This will be the three-time defensive player of the year's third comeback from a major injury and was asked if he hopes to contribute right away. 
this whole time I've been able to run, I've been able to work out my legs, I've been able to do agility drills, position drills. Um, so that has been a huge help, uh, both mentally and physically for this recovery. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about what I'm going to be able to do and um, get out there and, and help the boys. Speaking of exciting, Utah not wasting any time after their arrival in San Antonio for the Blair Alamo Bowl. They got on the practice field. They were on the field yesterday at Trinity University where they held their first workout since arriving in San Antonio to get ready for the big Alamo Bowl. They're putting their 11 and 2 record on the line against the Longhorns who are 7 and 5. It was great energy. We were inching. We were with our families, uh, spent time at home, and we were inching to get back out here. And it was great being out, being out here together and just getting the chemistry back right. It was a uh, it was good work. Just getting used to the humidity, just getting back to it. And uh, I think by game time we'll be used to the elevation. We're just trying to come in and get business done and execute and have great, some great practices beforehand. Yeah, and while the Utes were practicing, the Valero Alamo Bowl officials were painting the field for the big game on Tuesday night. Longhorns and Utes kick off Tuesday, 6.30 in the Dome. And, and that's the problem. Those guys are probably coming from some cold temperatures, and here they are at 70 degrees out there practicing. they got to get used to all this. This is not, not easy. He said elevation. Are we higher than Utah? Uh, I thought we would be. Maybe it's the drop down. In oh, yeah, what maybe. About. Mm -hmm. And the humidity. Well, these guys aren't used to that kind yeah, of humidity. Yeah, they're desert. In the middle of winter. Yeah. So, good luck. Good luck. They'll be sweating. I'm sweating. No, yeah, like you. <laughs> a plane crash in Kazakhstan has claimed the lives of at least a dozen people after it crashed right after takeoff. We see Julie McFarland has more from London. The plane crashed just a minute after takeoff with 100 people on board. The Interior Ministry saying at least 12 people are confirmed killed, the captain among the dead. Dozens hospitalized, some in critical condition. Everything got out of control. Everyone started screaming uh, and uh, shouting. And there was a key, uh, children's uh, crying, woman sounds. But I didn't hear any crew announcement, nothing. Footage from the scene. The jet's broken fuselage is scattered, building rubble in the snow. Bystanders and rescue workers combing through the debris to check for survivors. The Beck airplane reportedly lost altitude fast, eventually crashing into a nearby building shortly after takeoff from Almaty Airport, Kazakhstan's largest city. Beck is a Kazakh low-cost carrier. The airline has now suspended all flights pending an investigation. The cause of the crash is unclear, but the region has a history of poor flight safety records, with the former Soviet Union states frequently topping the list of the world's most accident-prone regions for aviation. Julia McFarlane, ABC News, London. Well, around America, police in Tennessee have picked up an accused killer who sparked chaos outside a Nashville bar. Michael Mosley has been held without bond in the stabbings of Clayton Bethard and Paul Trapini. Investigators say the situation escalated when Mosley, seen here on surveillance video, made an unwanted advance on a female friend of the victims. They got into a fight and the two were fatally stabbed. A third person was hurt and is recovering. After a brief manhunt, the 23-year-old suspect was found Christmas Day in a vacant house. All of a sudden, I heard the, the SWAT team. Hey, come out, come out, we got you surrounded. He surrendered without incident, but investigators say Mosley had a violent criminal history, including burglaries and assault charges. Overnight friends and family holding a vigil in memory of the victims with the community embracing the families facing an unthinkable loss during the holidays. A major break in the murder that stunned New York City, the stabbing death of Bernard College student Tessa Majors. Police have found the third teen wanted for questioning in the killing. The 14-year-old was released from custody and is now facing, is not facing any charges, but police say he was crucial in the investigation. A 13-year-old has been in custody since the day after the killing. He is now facing a felony murder charge. 
Taking a look outside at live cam, it looks sunny. It looks nice. Ooh, there was like a bee or something that just flew in front of live cam. Ooh, <laughs> he's got great weather to be buzzing around with. Is that going to last much longer, Justin? Yeah, it looks like he's a little messed up though. Like if, uh, listen, today is going to be nice. We're starting to see those clouds clear out a little bit, and so the sun's popping out temperatures as a result, jumping into the 70s. We raised high temperatures just a bit today because those low clouds burned off. If you're doing some traveling, there's one travel trouble spot, and that's out across the Four Corners region. We are seeing some flight delays around Phoenix. Uh, just a few, though, not, not big issues, and not much going on here across Texas, although we will start to see some rain showers arrive to the Lone Star State as we get into tomorrow. Temperatures right now here across Bear County in the 70s at the airport, Randolph. That's where we're seeing a little bit more sun. You get underneath the clouds as you go west of Bear County. 63 Bernie State, 61 Bandera. So temperatures going to be a little bit cooler there just because we're not seeing as much sun. Pauling County, if you missed it earlier, still want to pass this along because the numbers just are not good. 14,360 Mountain Cedar, 1,890 Mold, both in the high category. And Mountain Cedar has been pretty brutal the last couple days. 72 for the high. 67 by 7 o'clock, mostly cloudy skies, slight chance of a shower late this evening. A little better chance as we get into tomorrow. And we'll have a couple nice days after that, Sunday into Monday. We're going to take a look at that seven-day forecast coming up in just a couple minutes. Guys? Thank you, Justin. 2020 is an election year, and as we prepare for another wild year in politics, we want to take a look back at the monumental moments of 2019. From impeachment to a record number of challengers taking on President Trump, ABC's Karen Travers has a look. 2019 began with Democrats taking control of the House, with the federal government partially shut down. Nancy Pelosi once again making history as Speaker of the House. I now call the House to order on behalf of all of America's children. Go kids! The shutdown began in 2018 and lasted 35 days, the longest in U.S. history. We have reached a deal to end the shutdown and reopen the federal government. The president backing down, agreeing to a funding measure that did not include money for a border wall. The shutdown fight marked the start of a contentious year between the president and House Democrats. While out on the Democratic campaign trail, the largest and most diverse group of candidates in history, looking to oust President Trump from the White House. Vice President Joe Biden maintaining a narrow lead in most national polls since the start. The Trump administration's foreign policy this year centered largely on North Korea and the Middle East. In Vietnam in February, President Trump's second meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un ending abruptly. Basically, uh, they wanted the sanctions lifted in their entirety, and we couldn't do that. But four months later, history made at the border between North and South Korea. President Trump stepping across the DMZ into North Korea, the first U.S. president to do that. This was a very positive day, a very positive event, and I think it's good really for the world. But by the end of the year, little progress on nuclear talks. In October, President Trump announcing he would pull back U.S. troops from northern Syria, infuriating our Kurdish allies. Let someone else fight over this long, blood-stained sand. Generating backlash from some of the president's most loyal Republican supporters. If we abandon the Kurds, uh, it will be to our shame and to our national security detriment. Just weeks later, President Trump announced the U.S. military took out ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi in Syria. A brutal killer, one who has caused so much hardship and death, has violently been eliminated. In December, progress on two key trade priorities for the Trump administration. A deal with House Democrats on an updated NAFTA, now called the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement. And an agreement with China on phase one of a larger trade deal. The tariffs will largely remain 25% on $250 billion and we'll use them for future negotiations on the phase two deal. But throughout 2019, controversy loomed over the Trump White House. That was not a hoax. Robert Mueller's Russia investigation wrapped up with 37 indictments, including six close associates of President Trump, at least five prison sentences, and seven guilty pleas. But no legal action against the president. Did you actually totally exonerate the president? No. 
And then in September, a bombshell, a whistleblower complaint released, alleging wrongdoing by President Trump during a July phone call with the president of Ukraine, just one day after Mueller testified. Nearly $400 million in military aid and a White House meeting threatened to be withheld until Ukraine publicly announced an investigation into Joe Biden and his son. The president's actions have seriously violated the Constitution. President Trump has been consistent. He says he did nothing wrong. That call was perfect. It couldn't have been nicer. There was no pressure put on them whatsoever. But over weeks of dramatic testimony in November on Capitol Hill, current and former Trump administration officials said the president, his top aides, and his personal lawyer did just that. I then heard President Trump ask, so he's going to do the investigation. Ambassador Sondland replied that he's going to do it, adding that President Zelensky will do anything you ask him to do. On December 18th, the House approving two articles of impeachment, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. President Trump now the third president in U.S. history to be impeached. A trial in the Senate is expected to begin early next year. Karen Travers, ABC News, Washington. Well, the year is drawing to a close, and so is your chance to take advantage of some tax breaks for 2019. CNBC, CNBC recently mapped out some of the moves you can make during these last days of the year to help lessen your tax bill come April. Put aside money in your 401k plan at work. You have until the end of the year to do that. You can also reduce your taxable income by contributing to your health savings account, or HSA, and if you have health expenses, make sure you use the money in your healthcare flexible spending account. Whatever money you don't use by the end of the year, you'll end up losing. And there is still time to take advantage of environmentally friendly tax breaks. You can get a 30% credit for buying and installing solar panels through the end of the year. That credit will drop in the next few years. And after 2021, homeowners lose the tax break altogether. For more on tax saving tips for 2019, check out the full price at CNBC.com. Some of the nation's biggest cities have already pulled the plug on plastic bags. Now there is a push for Target to make that standard anywhere, everywhere. A change.org petition has collected more than 459,000 signatures. It was addressed to Target CEO Brian Cornell and other officials with the company. The petition says getting rid of plastic bags, quote, won't be convenient to us, but it is time to act. According to the movement, Target's plastic bags are choking the earth. Target says it's been working for solutions that are environmentally friendly. They say that includes making plastic bags that are partly made from recycled materials. Well, the holiday frenzy isn't over just yet for delivery drivers. Shipping companies are preparing for millions of people to return all those Christmas gifts they didn't like. In fact, January 2nd could be the biggest day ever for holiday gift returns. Several shipping companies have dubbed it National Returns Day. UPS expects a record 1.9 million packages to be returned next Thursday. That's a 26% increase from one year earlier, and that prediction is just for UPS, it does not include packages sent through the Postal Service or FedEx. UPS expects the record numbers because January 2nd is the first workday of the new year. The company also said many people buy online with the intention of returning the product if they didn't like it. I know so many people didn't like what they got. Yeah, uh, I know somebody who took some stuff back. Shh. Outside with live cam. Hey. Where we heard from a football player from Utah while well, they're talking about yeah. the humidity and trying to get used to it, but I think the fans are probably out there in shorts and t-shirts just really enjoying this weather. Sure, yeah. I mean, it is nice, and we'll have a lot of people in town welcome, by the way. Some good weather coming up Sunday and Monday. A little bit more cloud cover as we get into Tuesday. 70 the high so far today, 59 the low this morning. Averages are 63 and 41. Records are 82 and 22. And look at that, 22 set back in 1892. Yes, the records do go back that far. We're going to talk about some rain chances coming up. Beautiful. It's two days after Christmas, and it feels like a mm -hmm. South Texas Christmas because it's warm. Butimus. 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 What's butimus? It's an adjective that uh, I think he just came up with, but it works. You haven't heard that before? What is that? Butimus? Like beautiful. Beautiful. Butimus. Ah, man, y'all. 
Y'all got it. Y'all got it. I have no clue what he is talking about. Y'all got to get out more. <laughs> it's nice. You, you're right. Get it you is a nice. dictionary for slang. So look that one up. Slang dictionary. I'll urban I'll urban dictionary. Butimus. Urban dictionary. I bet it's at in, any rate, maybe uh, in Webster. Let's Pick take a look at the forecast for uh, the Alamo Bowl. We got some uh, decent weather coming up the next couple days. Uh, and by uh, New Year's Eve, we'll see a little bit more cloud cover. Uh, up to 58 for a high or so, and then the cloudy skies, maybe a few showers. But that tailgating, I think, should be just fine. So if you have plans to head out there uh, to the Alamo Dome, looks pretty good. Wanted to remind you about Mountain Cedar season. You probably already know this, but uh, just in case, this is where we are. Usually peaks at about mid-January, so we got some time here before we climb to the peak of this mountain. Uh, but today's count is actually at 14,000, so not a good situation. Mountain Cedar has been high. Uh, let's take a look at the time lapse. This really does tell the story. You see the fog we had there for just a little bit this morning, and then here comes the sun, and everything's dried out. 70 degrees right now. Dew point is at 58. We're seeing some blue sky out there. Southeasterly winds at about 10 miles per hour. It has really increased the humidity, and dew points are going to stay up through the afternoon, so it's going to feel just a little bit sticky outside. Temperature-wise, 63 in Kerrville, 59 in Rock Springs. It's a little cooler up here because we've got clouds that are still hanging on, but where we're seeing more sun, Temperatures have jumped into the 70s, and that includes up and down the I-35 corridor here. Uh, you see the southeasterly winds, what they're doing with the moisture, jumping up into the upper 50s, close to 60s. So it is, yeah, somewhat humid, at least by late December standards. The hope is that we'll take some of this moisture, squeeze it out, and get some showers and maybe some beneficial rain tomorrow. Although, i got to tell you, rain chances really aren't that great for Sunday. I think probably our better chance is on New Year's Day, and we'll show you that in just a second. Visible satellite picture shows we've got that cloud deck still hanging on over our western counties, and uh, still a few clouds here in San Antonio, then sort of a corridor of sun here from Austin to New Braunfels down to Seguin and back down towards Carnes City. Let's zoom out some, and I'll show you this next storm system, which is turning out over Arizona right now. Some snow and rain with this. Pretty big system. It's already throwing some showers in, in the direction of Texas. Texas Panhandle seeing a little bit of rain, and it will uh, have some effects on us as we get into tomorrow. But uh, a few light returns out there around Lakey, north of Uvalde, and I think we'll have about a 20% chance of rain today, especially if you are west of San Antonio, and that's showing up in the models now. Uh, even this afternoon uh, by tomorrow some drizzle in the morning. Here comes the front. I think by midday it's moving into the hill country close to San Antonio by the afternoon and the models have really been backing off significant rain with this. I still think we could get a shower or a thunderstorm, but even if you do see rain, it's not going to mount to much. This is all pretty quick moving and by Saturday at 10 o'clock all the rains out of here. We'll start to see some clearing skies and Sunday will be a little bit cooler and drier. 72 for the high today, mostly cloudy, 20% chance of a shower. 71 tomorrow, 30% chance of rain. 64 Sunday, 62 Monday with some chilly mornings. Clouds return New Year's Eve, and then I think on Wednesday we'll have a pretty decent chance of rain. Good news here, looks like it holds off until Wednesday afternoon. So for fireworks, all that good fun stuff we got going on for New Year's Eve, weather looks okay. Okay, so David wanted to prove a point. He looked up butifamous. Butimus. Oh, but, but, I mean, butimus. And it says. There's a word called butimus. Tremendously attractive, gorgeous, beauty, tremendous. It's tremendous and beauty. Okay. Together. Spot on. There you go. I believe him now. Stick around. Education. <laughs> right here. We'll be right back. A controversy in the spotlight. Movie scenes get cut for all sorts of reasons, but some are arguing this move was political. President Donald Trump had a seven second cameo in the holiday classic Home Alone 2 Lost in New York. There he is right there. But that scene was left on the editing room floor by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Excuse me, where's the lobby? Down the hall and to the left. Thanks. President Trump appeared to joke on Twitter that Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was behind the change. He also joked the movie will never be the same without him in it. CBC is setting the record straight. The network said the scene was cut in 2014 before Trump even announced his run for president. CBC also says other scenes that were audience favorites like Kevin going swimming and the Turtle Dove Exchange also got edited out. The reason? Time. Trudeau's office did not comment. Remember we showed you this video earlier this week and a look back at the year's viral moments. The internet blew up with that Peloton commercial of a husband gifting his wife the cycling bike. Now the actor, Sean Hunter, from the commercial, <coughs> excuse me, 
going viral again after making this a real life scenario. He got his real life girlfriend one of the fitness bikes for Christmas. He posted on Twitter saying, here's hoping this goes over better than the, the second time. The ad documenting the wife's year-long fitness journey did not go over well on social media. Critics made fun of the ad, while others said it was sexist and peddled a negative body image. Peloton said people misinterpreted the message behind it. Nike's new sneaker collection collaboration with Colin Kaepernick sold out in just one day. The Nike Air Force One True to Seven shoe released Monday. It features the former NFL quarterback's logo portrait and his former football jersey number seven in the hang tag. On the sole of the right shoe, the date August 14, 2016 is also printed, likely referencing the date Kaepernick first refused to stand for the national anthem to protest police brutality and racial inequality. See, those kind of shoes are the type that you don't wear out, so you don't scuff them up. I guess not. And you don't cut the hang tag off. No, that's important. Like trip. Here's a look at what's coming up on SA Live. Woo, you have what? been running up and down this court. You I know. smell like a wet dog. I'm chasing these kids around. <laughs> Ooh, tacos. <laughs> He's popping on my costume. <laughs> <laughs> they tell me, stop eating all the candies, Hansel. You're going to not be able to fit at your little horse in Hansel. <laughs> I keep eating all the candies now. talking about me entering their dreams. But what about my dreams? This is the one time a year I get to really experience life. And with the Poltergeist taking over SA Live, it is the perfect opportunity to take up my real passion.